I was going to say a couple of things about how the report came about. Um, John has worked uh, for many years on uh, questions of household indebtedness. And actually, this first began because you were telling me about a paper you wrote called The Pursuit of Past Happiness, which I thought was a brilliant uh, uh, title for a paper. And immediately made me think about some of my own uh, recent work uh, on the topic of happiness and unhappiness, which have been uh, published in a book uh, a few weeks ago called The Happiness Industry. Um, and in the happiness industry is really an exploration of how the measurement of affect, the measurement of emotion, particularly positive affect and happiness, have become incorporated into economics and incorporated into business. And why is it that <coughs> the measurement of happiness has uh, become as important as it is? Um, but also a critique of the way in which unhappiness has become rendered an increasingly uh, economic or behaviorist or uh, medical problem uh, and not actually addressed within its political, economic, uh, and social context. So the question of debt as the pursuit of past happiness immediately got uh, us uh, thinking and talking about what it would mean to think about uh, unhappiness or uh, a melancholic attachment to past decisions or past regrets or past pleasures that are no longer available, what it would mean to take that uh, analysis of uh, unhappiness or of depression and to uh, uh, locate it within its political economic context of a society that is building up larger and larger num amounts of private and household debt. And we thought this was an opportunity to do the kind of interdisciplinary political economic work that PERC uh, has been established to do. Um, now, we're very conscious that there's been a lot of research um, on linkages between uh, mental health and debt, and we've reviewed a lot of the research in the report. Uh, shortly after um, uh, beginning the discussions of this, of this project, we were very lucky to uh, take on Sarah Wallen, who's a, a PhD student uh, at Sheffield, uh, who has done a lot of the research, which actually is contained in the, in the report. And Sarah has looked at much of the um, uh, literature out there, which uh, uh, studies uh, the linkages between death and depression is going to be talking a bit about some of the evidence that, uh, that is reviewed in that. But we were also very keen uh, that we didn't uh, remain at the level of studying uh, either the you know, economic statistics or the uh, medical statistics, but to try to understand uh, the experiences of those suffering with problem debt and with depression through their own voices, um, partly as a way of pushing back against the happiness industry or the uh, excessively behaviorist uh, approaches to um, uh, 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 mental health and to unhappiness, which uh, in many ways uh, uh, crowd out or sometimes even silence the, the voices of people, uh, the explanations that people have of their own experiences, which necessarily cut across tidy disciplinary lines, necessarily indicate the, the complexity of the sorts of problems that arise when people are locked into uh, uh, forms of problem debt and when those uh, 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 forms of debt start to impact upon their mental and physical health. So I suppose at its boldest, the argument that I think we're making in the report is that a society that is increasingly trapped into uh, forms of debt uh, in a financial sense to the past uh, and by forms of inequality, which, uh, as Thomas Piketty's work shows, uh, mean that uh, past distributions of of wealth become more and more influential over uh, people's capacities to change their futures, that a society that is structured along these lines will have inherent tendencies towards, uh, if, not a, a not, if, if not necessarily um, depression in, uh, in a medical sense, but to uh, depressive types of culture uh, and psychology. Um, so what I think... The reason I think that it's important that we challenge uh, heavily individualistic uh, theories, uh, both of how people end up with debt and how people uh, develop mental health problems, is that in many ways, this is where I think a kind of psychoanalytic approach starts to become helpful. And uh, some of you will note that in, in, just in the title of the report, there is a, a nod to uh, a Freudian uh, notion of melancholia, ultimately, um, but that Policy approaches which seek to explain people's life chances and people's experiences purely in terms of their choices, their decisions, their behaviours, uh, their own um, uh, uh, sort of decisions about their, their bodies and about their uh, finances, uh, <coughs> contribute to the way in which people feel trapped 
by uh, their own uh, uh, past decisions, by their own uh, individual lifestyles, their own individual uh, behaviours, uh, and in that sense have a kind of uh, reinforcing dimension, which is, uh, uh, in some ways, I think this is what, one of the things we argue in the report, is in some ways reinforces uh, a depressive cycle, which tells people that they are responsible for uh, uh, the experiences that they have, for the debt that they have, for the uh, mental health uh, events that they have. And um, one of the, uh, there's been great work by Lynn Friedley recently on how positive psychology is being used in workfare uh, policy programs which in some ways seem to uh, excessively uh, try and sort of reinforce the sense that you can do anything about this. It's completely up to you. You are the only person who got you into the situation, so you're the only person who can get, get you out of this. One of the things that our research shows from looking at online debt forums is that this mentality of responsibility, of guilt, of self-reproach is already very well developed, is already internalised by many of the people struggling with the problems that we uh, address uh, in, our, in the report, uh, and that simply kind of uh, exaggerating that even further by saying, well, you've got to be even more positive to combat your negativity. You've got to be even more energetic to combat uh, the, the way in which you've been trapped into uh, a, a debt cycle uh, is in some ways just contributing further to the problem when people already uh, are feeling responsible, when people are already feeling guilty and, and feeling that it's all entirely up to them uh, to escape this kind of thing. Now, um, I suppose this is why I think that a political economy perspective on some of these problems, we can bring back in uh, evidence for ways in which people's uh, sense of uh, self-recrimination, uh, people's sense of feeling trapped, uh, actually are uh, uh, built into some of the uh, uh, political economic structures that they inhabit. Uh, and by explaining them from the perspective of political economy and by articulating how uh, heavily financialized societies and heavily unequal societies uh, have tendencies to put certain people into these situations, there is potentially something, uh, 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 if not uh, liberating, then certainly uh, uh, reassuring or potentially comforting about the discovery that one is not entirely responsible uh, for the uh, trap that one perceives oneself to be in. In a sense, perhaps in, a, in, in psychoanalytic terms or in Freud's terms, uh, that is one way of shifting from a culture of melancholia, of feeling entirely responsible and entirely trapped, uh, to a culture of mourning, where uh, the sources of suffering can actually <coughs> begin uh, to be identified as external to the self, uh, rather than uh, purely the fault uh, of the person who is suffering. Now, in terms of the rest of the discussion, we're going to the panel's going to be speaking for um, uh, until about uh, half one when we're going to have some coffee arriving. Um, and uh, first of all, you're going to hear from Sarah Wallin uh, and Jonna uh, Montgomery about some of the arguments, some of the evidence that is contained in the report, both in terms of the literature review and the study of online uh, uh, debt forums that we looked at. We're then going to have responses from, um, who's going to go first? It's Sarah. And then we're going to have responses from Lynn Friedley from uh, Hubbub. I don't know if that's your main affiliation, but um, uh, from uh, Sam Kerwin from uh, Bristol University and from Kath Rock from Money Advice Trust. And we're then going to have uh, an hour for an open discussion uh, where you can contribute thoughts, uh, ideas, arguments, which we hope, we're going to take a lot of notes, we hope is going to turn into uh, a, a set of uh, policy ideas or a set of um, uh, proposals that we might be able to take forward uh, in, in an open letter or something of the sort. But I'm now going to hand over uh, to Sarah. There is such a strong correlation between debt and mental health problems, but on the one hand, individuals with mental health problems are more likely to incur debt and on the other hand having debt is, is likely to have a range of negative impacts on your well-being both physically and mentally. Um, for example there's loads of kind of issues around definitions, statistics and so on in this literature so take the figures with a pinch of salt but Jenkins, a study by Jenkins suggested that about 50% of people that are having so-called problem debt i.e. they can't repay their debts uh, have a mental disorder. Um, but what happens within a lot of the quantitative research is that it becomes a real question around, so does having debt, does it cause mental disorders? Does it actually directly cause mental issues? Um, some of the, the literature, such as studies by Gallagher, that's referenced here, does say that this happens, and you can prove this in more objective terms over time. But perhaps what we see that this side of the literature shows, which is mixed methods, loads of civil society organisations, 
by the way, there might be some of you in this room, and this is only indicative, so if I miss somebody out, it's not, no offence, I hope <laughs> I've looked at your studies. Um, but what this one actually shows is just how entangled the dynamic between mental and physical health is, and how indebtedness and socioeconomic factors come into this. Within the report, we try and link this specifically to a perspective of inequality. Um, but the main bit I did to try and take this forward is actually to try and go beyond the statistics and look at people's voices, people's experience of indebtedness, and try and foreground this. Um, so to this purpose, I looked at peer-to-peer -peer forums, um, happy to take more questions in the peer-to-peer -peer forums as well, uh, but briefly, these are m very unused online resources in which people with debt communicate with each other, relaying their experiences, giving each other advice, emotional support, etc. Uh, so we see them as quite a unique and underused resource uh, to explore these kinds of issues. Um, um, so I looked at three main forums, the Consumer Action Group and the Money Saving Expert and Mumsnet. These are all three quite different forums, but they give you a sort of broadest uh, spectrum of who engages in this debate. Um, I'd like to spend the most time, though, actually talking about what I found in these forums. And I want to use that particularly from the perspective of actually trying to relay some of the voice that we find in these. The first set of findings concerned the psychology of indebtedness, where a lot of people talk about being stuck in the past. They made one unfortunate decision when they were 19 or 20 and they took out a, a credit card that they couldn't manage and so on. And they feel acutely ashamed and responsible for this. For example, as one, one of the second part indicate here, it's a bit small, so I'll read it. I am 31 and still live at home. I feel like my life is on hold until I am debt free, and that will be a long, long time, which when I stop to think about it, scares the crap out of me. I honestly feel that until I'm debt free, I cannot move on, and it's crippling. So in the report, we refer to this as the rear-facing psychology of indebtedness, where the only way to move forward is to tackle your debt. What we also do in the, see from these forums is contrary to this popular narrative of the indebted as being irresponsible or irrational, they feel an acute sense of responsibility for what has happened. Some of the posters even take on responsibility for the debt of their partners or of their loved ones, where they try and you know, manage the sort of <coughs> dealings with creditors or debt collectors to, to spare their partners this emotional injuries. Um, what we also see is that, in contrary to debt, how debt is individualised and seen as a problem of a private person. The forum shows how that it's so entangled in social relations. One of the major themes is how the debtors have this sense of dual obligations to their families. For instance, you know, the, the kids want new clothes, you want to go on holidays, you want to have a nice time together. But they also have this moral bond to their creditors. Um, so this can be extremely stressful, for and it has links to the wider literature as well. For example, the Centre of Social Justice talks about how indebtedness can be a factor in family breakdown, for instance. Um, the second finding, as I think we've been hinting at, is just how entangled debt and depression actually are. Um, they show this really complex interrelationship between debt and health, which cuts across like what we think is maybe medical, what is social, what is financial, what is psychological. One of the th big themes is that debt can be this downward spiral, um, where something happens, um, like an, a simple misfortune or an unexpected loss. Um, often these, the people that this goes really badly for are the people in precarious employment or in low income. Uh, so once you lose your income, uh, things can really escalate, as we see in one of these quotes. Um, I can read to you the second one. All was well and good until I had an accident at work and was initially signed up for physical injuries, and then for reactive disorder, depression, and was put on antidepressants. A few weeks of work I handled in my notice at work, as I thought I was better off out of the job. I then carried on a high spending on credit cards, using them as a means to live on, not wise in hindsight, but building up the debt that now has taken over my life. I also registered as self-employed, thinking I could take on the world. This tendency of linking manic, there's lots of research, for instance, linking manic phases of depression and mental illness to, 
you know, escalating in spending and, and so on. But this actually shows that it can be sequences that comes before those sort of manic spending instances. Um, the third main theme that we develop in this report is this emphasis on action and the question of, you know, if you take action towards becoming debt free, you will also become happy and empowered within this process. In a way, debt is, being in debt is perceived as the loss of control. You are entirely in the hands of your creditors and they can decide your future and your everyday life. Um, as we see in the first quote, this person really believes that, that clearing debt will make him a free person. My partner is 20, I am 19. We misjudged things in the past and different reasons account for different debts. I know there's no excuse, but I just want to be debt free as I believe it can make me a happier, more free person. <coughs> but debt becomes this emphasis of taking control over one situation. You know, you start counting your money and you start dealing with your creditors. In some of the forums, they talk about this as your light bulb moment, where you realize the extent of your indebtedness and just what you have to do to clear it. Um, and, and clearly within this process, you start like taking up, you can see how clearing debt becomes such a big part of your life. You start managing yourself. Uh, a lot of the, di of the posters actually compare it to dieting um, as a way of not just managing your money, but you, but you organize your household, you, you take control of your food, you start running, you know, you do all of these things in the idea that you will become a more controlled person. Um, but, but this sort of element of control also sort of spills over into <coughs> attempts to control your family's life and control the expenses of your partners in ways that can be seen as intrusive. Um, there are, what we find in how people relay lots of these threads of long, long narratives about this journey out of debt. Uh, but there is some real contradictions in terms of whether dealing with your debt is actually equaling the gain of control and autonomy and whether it makes you happy. Um, clear, in one sense, clearing was that clearly means that you recede some autonomy. A lot of people have entered a debt management plan, for instance, where a third party manages their expenses and deals with their creditors. Um, there's also a real tension of mixed emotions around the use of money. Uh, sometimes spending money can be this momentary like relief uh, where you go out and treat yourself to a nice lunch or you, you do something with your family. But other kinds of expenses become um, completely unmanageable and perceived as setting you off track, such as your car breaks down, you need dental work. Um, so one of the things we've thought a bit more about and that John is going to take over is this idea of relief. How do you exit this cycle? Um, in the forums, there's lots of discussions about Bankruptcy. Some people posit bankruptcy as the way to have a clean slate. This will be. This will set them free. Whereas other people are terrified. In some of the more harrowing threads, um, people also talk about suicide as their only way out. Part of the problem around around issues to do with indebtedness, kind of from a, a political economy perspective, is the way in which um, the the kind of real social and wider costs are depoliticized. Uh, so we were in this effort trying to bring different stakeholders in the conversations around what debt is doing to our political economy, to our society. Um, and this report was kind of one effort in that direction. So we wanted to end it looking at kind of different pathways forward. And one of them, I think, that's really important, I realize now it's in yellow, says, you know, listening to the indebted. That basically we need to develop a kind of alternative approach that is about kind of foregrounding and empathizing and listening to the life stories of the indebted. I say this as someone who kind of has to deal, you know, with, again, the policymakers seek, seek causality. So when we kind of engage in excessively trying to find what causal mechanisms are at work to make people in debt, we forget that actually evidence gathering is about listening as well, that we, you know, that empirical evidence is gathered through qualitative means and to, to understand what debt is doing, rather than what, it, what causes it in the first place, is, is, a, is an important shift that we need to make. And to do that, we need to listen to those that are struggling financially, because this will give us an indication of where action is needed in order to uh, provide some way of dealing with the problem that debt is causing within the wider political economy. Um, Part 
part of this is about kind of openly debating the kind of contested moralities of debt. So we see time and time and time again in the forums, but also in public dialogue. Again, we could bring Greece in here uh, for all of you that have not been following the news, <laughs> um, which I'm sure is uh, very few of you. You know, they, they, we can see clearly how the moralities of debt are very clearly articulated, at, you know, through the mainstream media around um, what your obligations are as a debtor to pay. Um, and when you see an entire, you know, sovereign nation state being put under the lash to pay its debt, you can understand how it is very, very easy for people to internalize um, even more so the kind of shame and embarrassment that is felt around having debt. So I come at this again as, as someone who is a specialist in banking, you know, that's kind of what I did my, my PhD in, to, and understanding as I do about how debt is created in the banking system, which is effectively um, through the stroke of the keyboard. You know, the, the, the people who are issuing these credit contracts, the institutions that are issuing the credit are doing it without any limits to reserves. They aren't doing it based on bank loans or how much reserves of, of gold they have. And there is no firing up of the printing presses anymore. These are all metaphors that don't actually reflect the reality. Debt is created very easily. But the only thing that makes a debt real is the legal contract between the debtor and the creditor. So we need to kind of, again, begin to open up the morality and the questions around morality to pay one's debts. Because one of the first things that happened in the UK in the 1970s that allowed for debt to begin to escalate was the elimination of usury laws. So when you eliminate usury laws that actually are specifically aimed to prevent debt being exploitative, and then turn around and everyone gets more and ever higher escalating levels of debt and then turn around and say, well, actually you have a moral obligation to pay. We also have to look at the flip side of that around what are the moral obligations of a creditor to, to, to provide, uh, you know, if all they're providing is a loan and that loan is causing real social and economic harm in the long term, then we need to start uh, beginning to reframe the kind of moral debates around what that means. So... <clears throat> And I take this example of firms going bankrupt and say that, you know, we need to recognize that financial debt is created and discharged every second of every day. Loan contracts are issued, but also loan contracts are discharged. Uh, firms can do it quite easily. People, on the other hand, are, are not given the same privilege. So maybe one way we can begin to contest the morality of debt is to sort of take this idea that if... If firms are people, if corporations are people, then what about people being more like corporations and being able to discharge their debts without being pulled down into a debt spiral that lasts years and years and inflicts untold emotional, social, family harm? Well, it's not really untold. We actually know we can quantify these uh, to quite a large extent these days. Um, and where does that lead us? Well, the report ends around this notion of debt relief. And again, um, it was the lead up to the Greek referendum when we were finalizing it. So I think it, it, it was one of these things I could have just kept writing and writing, but I just left that at, at the end of the report, you know, to be continued. But debt relief here is not just about the kind of act of restructuring debts between creditors and credit obligations. That is one part of it, and I am a firm supporter, as are kind of 35 leading economists in this country writing letters saying we need debt relief, uh, not just Greece, but you know uh, people as well, um, to talk about debt relief also in its effect to the people who are suffering, the individuals whose voices we're listening to. We can begin to imagine what we would say to these people who say, I cannot continue. And we said, okay, you know, let's not, let's not go too far. Before you get divorced, before you end it all, Let's just see if we can't get rid of some of that debt since it was created so easily, since you've made interest payments up until this point. There is a rational, reasonable argument made, to be here, made here that says we need to be sensible about this. So while, you know, again, to draw on the Greek comparison, you know, while the, the elites are, are, are cornered in some uh, palatial, I'm sure, uh, conference room trying to squabble over who, you know, squabble over money, let's take the kind of human empathetic approach that says, let's be reasonable about this here. Let, you know, the, this is not, debt is not worth dying over. And, 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 and I think that that's an important, you know, the way Sarah says that in the end, there's a lot of talk in these forums. You know, please don't take a rash decision. Call someone now. How often um, suicide is evoked as the kind of final answer, right? And I know that makes, I'm sure 
many of you, uh, as a political economist, we never talk about it. So it makes people a little uncomfortable. But I think that that is the thing that brings it home for me is like, what are you studying that, that really matters here? And debt it is something that is having real effects. So debt relief is, is about economic revitalization. We want economic renewal. We have to forgive the debts uh, of kind of 15 years ago that people are still paying interest on, or 10 years ago. But also the kind of social, cultural, psychological relief that will come for those people who are really suffering to, to just end the debt trap. Um, because this is what will end, which will create the light at the end of the tunnel, something that we can work for, that is a positive vision of change. It's not anti this or anti that, or it, it's a positive vision of economic and social renewal uh, around a topic that I think a lot of us can find common ground.